morning, open arms. How are we doing this fine and wonderful day? And a special hello to all of my friends out in Port Allegheny. Welcome. Welcome. All right. So I hope that you all had your coffee. You've got your snacks. If not, they are out in the lobby. Make your way in. Stand and join us as we get ready to worship today. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul, I need you, oh, I need you, your forgiveness, like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, like a sound of symphony to my ears, like Welcome again, everyone. We're excited to have you here. I want to pray just a quick anointing over all of you that as you greet your neighbor, you will not get sick. And that goes for Port Allegheny, too. So take a moment, greet elbow your neighbor, rub. find somebody you know, find somebody you don't know, fist bump, elbow, hug. It works.
of worship and bowing our hearts before him and recognizing and knowing what is it, Lord, that is in the way today? What is, what is in our hearts that we need to bring to you to make ourselves right, to come and remember your sacrifice for us today? So on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord. There you go. Thank you, Lord. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's go ahead and, and pray. Father, Holy Lord, we come before you today. Lord, your broken body, your blood, that was poured out for us, for our sin. Lord, thank you for that sacrifice for us. Had you not died for us, we would be condemned, we'd be separated forever, Lord. But we get to enter into this new covenant because of you, because of your gift for us, your great love for us that could not separate, could not stand us to be separated from you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, prepare our hearts today, surge us. And when we lose our way, help us to remember, to keep that focus on you, Lord, to bring it all and lay it bare before you today. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we worship you in Jesus' name. So today we invite you to come and to receive from the Lord today his, his sacrifice, his blood poured out for you, his body broken for you today. And search your hearts, take a moment and come forward to receive when you're ready.
hands, I want you to own this bridge here, even when you don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Come on. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, see it even when I don't feel it. I'm going I'm to ask for, for all of you to join join me in this. Just close your eyes and, and in Port Allegheny don't, for, don't forget you're a part of this too. You're a part of this too. Just close your eyes and, and enter into this place. Uh, this bridge that says even when I don't see it even when I don't feel it. I want, you to, I want you to understand that see and that feel. And that's why you're closing your eyes. And I, I want you to understand that we don't see it all the time. We don't feel it all the time. We don't always have this, this life that everything is perfect and look good. And everything is, it's just, it's peachy keen and it's roses. We, we don't see it. Sometimes we don't feel it, but he's at work in our lives. And I want you... You've come in here, and I don't want you to have this mask on. I don't want you to come in here thinking, like, I got it all together. Because I'll tell you right now, I don't have it all together. <laughs> There's times when I don't see it. There's times when I don't feel it, and I need it. And so I want, I want you to own this bridge. I want you to own this song. Let Jesus be your way maker. Let God be the light in your life. So that no matter what's going on, no matter what storm, no matter what trial, you're in this place to where even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, he's working. So I want you, I want you to sing it. We're going to go back into it. All right, right, here we go. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I, come on, sing it out. Own this. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. I want to hear you from Port Allegheny. Come on now. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Come on, we're not going to be fake anymore. We're going to be real even when we don't see it. Come on now. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Yeah. 
That's who he is. Yeah, give him glory. Give him praise. I want you to own this. That's who he is. And he never stops. Because our sight fails us. Because our feelings lie to us does not mean that God has ever stopped chasing you down. Because he is the way maker. God, thank you for being the way maker. Thank you for being the way maker. Amen and amen. Man, when he moves, he moves, doesn't he? Amen. Amen. All right. So take a moment, have a seat, and compose yourself. <laughs> that was more hard me. after that. Um, <laughs> if you need to fall out, that's okay. Woo. Like fall out, that's all right. You, there ain't no judgment here. Uh, go ahead and turn your attention to the screen uh, because we got a cool little video for you. So I love you guys. Welcome home. Welcome to Open Arms. We're glad to see everyone here today and those in Port Allegheny as well. Good morning. Good to see you guys or used to, to see us rather. Um, in the seat backs in front of you, it, you'll see uh, this group of cards here. We're going to take out our connection card, if you will, and um, fill this out as much as you feel comfortable. We would love to follow up with you about your experience here today. Regulars, first time guests, please all of you uh, fill this out. Turn it in at the end of service. We want to, to follow up with you and uh, about your experience today. There's also places to respond to announcements. So in your program, um, other announcements and things that you would like to get involved with, fill it out here as well, um, and other things to, to sign up for as well. And um, these are other cards that you can turn in at the end of service as well. So if you have a need for prayer, want to get involved in serving or join a group, you can grab one of these and check out what's involved on there. Um, our serve card, we're going to highlight our children's ministry again. So last week we had Annette up here with us and, and just sharing her heart about what God's doing in the children's ministry. And it is exciting to see the future of our church growing downstairs. And, um, and it is in no way babysitting or a chore. It is a blessing to be able to pour into these kids. It's so much fun, too. Um, and, and we would love to, to see you get partnered with that opportunity to just invest in these kids' lives. If you want to get signed up to serve there, um, check uh, under Thrive Children's Ministry. Annette will follow up with you uh, and her team and get you plugged in there. Um, we want to highlight our moms group as well. So the second and fourth Saturdays of the month, 9 a.m. If you have young children, if you want looking for some community, come on out to that and, um, and get involved and get that encouragement and support you need and some fun playtime for the kids together too as well. Um, and then our next steps classes. So today we're going to be having start here and step two. So start here is where you're exactly that. Going to be starting here. If you're wondering how to partner with us as a church, what, what are we all about? How can you start this journey with us? Uh, join us today for that as well. And then 
Um, step two, uh, starting into the discipleship journey. So wh what does it mean to be a follower of Christ and, and how do I grow in my faith? So that will be today. Um, but today also sign up for steps three and four. So next week on the 15th, we're uh, going to be launching step four. So uh, step three is our shape. So how has God uniquely gifted us to serve in within our church and, and also with that out in the community as well and, and ways to get plugged in. And then step four is how do, how do I share my faith? How do I tell my story? Um, and we can help walk you through that process as well. Um, so those are opportunities to sign up for next week as well. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our service. We have a special guest today. Bishop Linda Adams has uh, joined us. And uh, what a blessing. She was the first woman ever to be elected bishop in the Free Methodist Church, the, the history of the Free Methodist denomination. So praise God. Yes, that's exciting to have her here with us in Bradford and to have an opportunity to hear her speak. She was formerly the director of International Child Care Ministries, and then before that was a pastor for many years. Um, so just to, to hear from her and her heart today, and in just getting to know her as well, um, it's just been a blessing to see her heart for, for the loss, for uh, those hurting and broken, and, um, and to be that, that light and that advocate and encourage us all in that as well. So, um, so what a blessing to have her. If you're ready, we'll go ahead and get started with the service. Direct your attention to the screen. Thank you. open arms. There's a lot of life in this place. Even on a morning where you had one hour less sleep, here we are, worshiping God, enjoying him with a lot of high energy too. Hey, I wanted to tell you that I've just, ha I've been looking forward to this since uh, Pastor Zoe took the first chair position at the beginning of January. She and I have been connecting um, by email every week and a few times by Zoom, and I've really enjoyed getting to know her. And also just to to love your church from afar, but it's a lot better to be right here. It's one thing to see you on a screen. It's another thing to see your faces and just to recognize the life transformation that's going on here. I mean, I do, I think that uh, Rich had like a checker flag racing shoes on. I think you guys are like the lead, you're the pace setter car for a lot of churches. You really are doing what Jesus says matters. So last night I started reading your little book, Greater Than, one by one, chapter by chapter, the story of lives that are being changed. And the end of every one of those stories is we ended up at Open Arms Church. What a coincidence. And I left that this morning on purpose in my hotel room at the Holiday Inn Express with a little note and a nice tip for the staff to say, you know, there might just be somebody right here on this staff that, that needs to read that because somebody's just right now this morning saying, oh God, how do I get out of this mess? And he has an answer. And so I just really applaud you for reaching out to your community, your whole county, and just letting people know there is hope. There is a better life. There is a way out. So praise God for that. I've been asked to just kind of step into the flow here with this series called Rags to Riches. And the thing that, that, um, that I bring to the conversation is a global perspective. Because for the last 11 years, as Director of International Child Care Ministries, I got to travel to 40 countries. And some of them, like Haiti, 15 times. We have 59 schools in Haiti. And so I've been able to see uh, with a little bit sort of bigger eyes, fresh eyes. And I didn't know an awful lot of this stuff until I started this. But God had a curriculum for me. And I've learned a few things. And it's just an honor to be able to pass them along to you this morning. So I'm excited for that. Thank you for giving me the chance. So first, I want to show you kind of a throwaway picture, but this was for the band and for Rich. So 1975, I was in a Jesus rock band called His Majesty's Kingdom Band. Uh, 
Now, I'm showing you that for a couple of reasons. One is you just never know what's going to happen with your life, Rich. You might be a bishop one day. You never know. The other thing is that that was 45 years ago. Like most of you weren't even alive back then. And I can witness to you that Jesus has been faithful every day, every day. He's always working. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. And I can still tell you 45 years later, I'm singing his praise because he is good. Praise God. All right, let's go into the story. I'm just calling it my radical 10-year learning curve or straddling the gap. You know, I just have had the weird experience of having one foot in both worlds. I get on an airplane and I fly to some place that's like 100 years behind us in technology and a whole different reality. And so then I come back home and I've got to get used to just what we call normal. And so it's been a learning curve. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's do this. So in those 32 countries that I had visited at that point, this is their average daily income. And I know you can't read all those country names at the bottom because it's probably too small to get them all. But you can see that there's a $5 a day line about halfway down the chart, right? So all of those people in those countries are living at less, 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 and some of them are down to about $2 a day, okay, $24 a month. The ones on the left in yellow are Latin America. And then you come into two colors of green, that's the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Red is Africa, so there's one, Nigeria is clear over here, and then they get, and then the white one is Haiti. I showed this chart in Haiti, and they could not believe there would be seven countries in Africa that are poorer than they are. They thought, we're at the bottom of the heap for the whole world. But this is just to help us get a little perspective when we're thinking about riches and poverty, where do we fall? So the next chart, chart shows us that. That's the same chart, only with the U.S., on the left. So eye-opening to just recognize that we get caught into a poverty mentality because we've decided that our wants are our needs. And there's an all kinds of stuff we complain about. Have you seen any of these memes that are called first world problems? I'm really aware of them now. Here's a few examples of stuff that we might whine and complain about. Well, first of all, I I'm busted. I want to mention that this is my reality. So I have people from the Philippines and Haiti and Africa who have come and stayed in John's and my home. And if we open the closet door and they see all those coats, first of all, they can't believe there's only two people in the house. They might also wonder why we like brown coats so well. But they might think that I don't know my Bible or I just don't think it matters to obey Jesus. Because remember what he said about coats? If you have two, give one away to somebody that doesn't have one. Why do I think this is okay? So we moved a few months ago. I did give away a few. I need to give away more because yes, I live in Michigan. It's cold there like here. Yeah, it's okay, but, but the idea is that we have a lot more stuff. In fact, I realized when we moved and we loaded up that giant truck that we've, we're drowning in stuff. We got way more than we need, but we don't usually think it. So here we go. Those, here come those funny little first world problems like this one. My roommate ate a hot dog without a bun. Now I have an uneven ratio of hot dogs to buns. This is a problem. <laughs> okay, how about this one? I had too much food on my plate. Peas kept falling off. Oh well. Some of you don't like peas anyway. My treadmill is broken, so I have to run outside. <laughs> that one says yes. <laughs> okay. I poured my cereal into the bowl without checking to see if we still had milk. We didn't. <laughs> okay. My teacher said he was going to let us out early, but he didn't let us out early. Poor me. And then finally, my laptop is dying, but my charger is all the way upstairs. Okay, can we laugh at ourselves for a minute? <laughs> because first world problems might annoy us. We might get annoyed at each other too when we find ourselves whining and complaining about stuff that really doesn't matter. But the thing is, we need a little help to get some perspective, you know? If you're around people who spend five hours a day carrying water from a little muddy water hole back to the house in order to have something to drink and cook with and wash with, you start to go, next time you turn on the tap and you get nice clean water coming right out, you just go, whoa, that's a privilege. I didn't even know it was a privilege, but you just gotta get your eyes open by someone else's experience. Let's go to the next slide. I want to introduce you to my teachers. So this was my 10th year pastoring New Hope Church in the center of Rochester, New York. Kind of a diverse downtown church. And we were having a blast. I loved it there. We had a 
certain amount of uh, socioeconomic diversity in our church, but we mostly thought of ourselves as toward the lower end. You know, we had uh, people that lived paycheck to paycheck. We had people on public assistance. We had people who didn't know really how they were going to get by. But we also had some people with steady jobs and, and a little bit of a mix. One day on a Sunday morning in May of 2007, these people walked into the church. This family, only seven of them came the first day because that's as many as they could squeeze into a taxi. So they came from the Democratic Republic of the Congo as refugees. Now who pays attention to what's going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo? Here's the deal. There was tribal warfare and horrible violence going on back then, and it is still going on in Eastern Congo, North and South Kivu, and this is where they're from. Their particular tribe was on the outs with the government, and the president actually said, here's a date. He made it like open season, like deer season. He said, if you don't leave the country by this date and somebody kills you, it's not my fault. So they had to leave, and their papers were torn up at the border, and they went to another country and were thrown into a refugee camp. And then violence broke out in the camp, and their seven-year-old daughter, Deborah, was shot to death, and they had to run for their lives. They didn't even have time to bury her. They had a plane ticket for her to come to the U.S. That's how close it was to their day to come. So they were just trying to come through life, and they showed up at our church. So you can imagine... They came walking in the back door with these bright colored dresses. The, man, the men had on suits and ties. Of course, they were the only ones in the room with suits and ties. The women also had these bright colored cloth head things. And so, you know, all heads turn, all eyes latch onto these people coming walking in. And then at the end of the service, Heritage, who's on the left, spoke and translated on behalf of uh, Prudence, his father, who's on the right. They had come here with their Bible, their songbook, their free Methodist transfer letter, and the clothes on their back. And he said, we have no motherland, no fatherland. We are orphans. The free Methodist church is our family, and you are our mother. <laughs> I was like, oh, welcome home. Yeah, what do you say? What do you do? Did you see the movie Elf? Like somebody shows up on the front door, and it's like, oh, you're mine? Okay. And then here's what happened. I found out that God really brought them to us for our own sake, to change us in some ways to turn us right side up. I also didn't know he was preparing me for a global assignment, but that came later. So the first Sunday after we worshiped in the morning, I invited them back for prayer meeting in the evening. We called it power hour. So seven of them got in a cab and came back and there were only six people in church that night for prayer meeting. And, and Heritage said, where is everybody? I said, well, this is who comes to power hour. And he goes, where's all those people that were here this morning? And I said, well, I'm thinking they're watching TV. You know, they're, they're, they're home. And he said, are they Christians? And I said, well, yeah, I think they're Christians, but they're also Americans. And American Christians think that prayer meeting is optional. So they're just scratching their heads like, what did they stumble into? Who are we and, and, and how much faith do we have? So because here's the deal. For people who have absolutely nothing, you know, when your village is burned and your cows are stolen and you're stripped of everything you've ever had, including your country, and then your daughter is killed and then you run for your life, guess what you have? You have Jesus. You have prayer. You hold on for dear life. And so we saw over time, that this family, even though they're poor in the ways that we're kind of rich, they're rich in the ways that we're poor. See, first of all, they helped us to see that we had all kinds of stuff we didn't even realize we had. We gave them furniture, appliances, linens, clothes, English lessons, driving lessons. Started out in the church parking lot, not a good idea. Went off to the go-kart track, that was better. We had something to give, something to share. And guess what? They had a lot to share with us because the ways that they're rich, they, laid, they, they just showed us a great example. For instance, when I would go visit an American family as a pastor, it's a dying art, pastoral visits, but I would show up once in a while to an American family and they would expect me to be there five or 10 minutes. They may or may not let me in the living room or turn off the TV. 
This family, if I showed up to their house, the mother would give a $10 bill to one of the teenagers and send them to the store to buy groceries because we were going to have a meal. And then I would know I was going to be there for four or five hours. And we're going to sit and talk. And we're going to hear stories. And we're going to cry. And we're going to laugh. And we're going to pray. And then at the end, all those teenagers are going to get off their screens and come to the living room and form a circle and sing a blessing over me and pray for their pastor. Wow. These people are rich in faith, in prayer, in family solidarity, in respect for their elders and their pastor. They're rich in languages. Princess, who's the second one in there, spoke seven languages when she got here. One of them was French, and she learned English in two months. There's some smarts going on there. So we had a little bit to learn, didn't we? But they were also showing me some things that I learned late in life in order to get ready to lead ICCM. So let's look at four facts I learned late. The first one is tribalism. When they told my story, I just, I just didn't understand that in this day and age, there's still a lot of tribal conflict and people killing each other just because of their ancestry or their clan. Did you know that? I mean, it's not like on the front of the news here. Let's look at some of tribalism. So there are tribes without a country. This is a family from the Lahu tribe in the north of Thailand. So in the 20th century, when colonial powers were leaving countries, they would divide up the territory by arbitrary lines on the map. And sometimes they would divide in one, in two or four pieces a tribal property. And so now no country thinks they belong to them. Everybody says, you belong over there. Nobody wants them. They don't have human rights in any of those four societies. They don't go to school. They, don't get, they, they just don't get acknowledged. And who would have ever thought of that kind of consequence when, when superpowers leave countries? Here's another example. In India, you've heard of the the caste system, right? So it's technically outlawed, but it's so much a part of Hinduism that it's really still there pretty much. But at the bottom of the caste system, you have the outcasts or the Dalits, and below that you have the tribals. And so this would be people who live in the jungles and get by, usually illiterate, many times just, you know, uh, surviving hand to mouth. Um, but they haven't even had human rights or recognition as citizens until 1949. Before that, not even acknowledged. So here we are with children and adults who are just consigned to the bottom. Okay, let's go to another one. Tribes, some tribes in this world are thought by other people to be incapable of, of learning. So this is a group called the Fulani tribe. They are nomadic herdsmen, um, Muslims in Nigeria. And for a thousand years, they've never gone to school, but now things are changing and they need to go to school. Kids need to go to school to have any future in that society anymore because of land owning rights and all that kind of stuff. So we have some schools for them. And the Ministry of Education sent somebody over to check it out. And there was a little girl with chalk in her hand doing math on a chalkboard. And the woman from the Ministry of Education said, oh, they're educable. And I think that she, it would be like if you saw your dog calculating math, and you would just think, what, what, what? They've got that kind of brain? They could do that? So I just didn't know that we people have put ourselves in hierarchy by race and tribe and ethnicity in such a way that we judge each other as less than, and it's true all over the world. Okay, so let's go to that next slide. This is in contrast to God's view of this world and his kingdom, where the reign of God is happening, every tribe, language, and nation is wonderfully welcomed and valuable into the kingdom of God. Look at Revelation 7, 9. This is a little glimpse into our future. You're going to be there. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and the Lamb. This is God's vision for the people of the world, that they would all be brought to Jesus. Let's go to the next lesson or fact that I learned late. This is a word called gender side. They had to make up the word in the last 20 years or so because of the practice. The three most dangerous words in the world are, it's a girl. 
There is actually a documentary by the title, It's a Girl, you can look it up and read it, watch it and weep. Let's look at this statistic. More baby girls are killed in the two most populous nations in the world, you know which two they are, every year, simply for being female, than are born in the US. So that's either pre-born baby girls or after birth, being left outdoors to the elements or thrown in, uh, thrown in the water or buried alive. I've heard all those stories. Because boys are preferred, there are economic reasons and cultural reasons that girls are less valuable. But that isn't the kingdom of God. That's not the God who made them. He doesn't see it that way. And I know you don't either. But it's a, it, it hurts my heart to know this is the case. Let's look at a couple of things here. So this is a group of girls that live in a hostel that we run in the south of India. They're born into a tribe which traditionally provided the temple prostitutes. So when a girl is born into that tribe in generations past, the parents would just know that this little girl, at some point in her childhood, will be taken off to the temple for that purpose. But these girls are getting a whole different life. They're learning about Jesus. They're safe. They're being educated. I asked them once, so what's the best thing about living here? And one of them said, electricity. Because I can do my homework. Because I didn't have any way to do my homework after dark. Okay, so like little things like electricity come, come in handy. Okay, and let's go to the next one. I know that you sponsor as a church at least one girl in Haiti. She's a little older than these. But I just wanted to remind you that we've got 59 schools in Haiti and about half of the kids going to them are girls, of course. Let's go to the next. Here's what God said. I just quoted from Revelation at the end of the Bible. Now we're going to the beginning of the Bible where it's all laid out. God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. You know... A lot of times little girls have a hard time believing that they're equally made in the image of God because we call God Father and we refer to him as he. And so it feels like they're kind of like one step removed from the full image of God. But, you know, that, that means that we're mixed up about that. It's not talking about what we look like. Male and female both are clearly um, expressions of the totality of who God is. And he made it, it was very good that we were made for one another. And so little girls too here in Bradford and over in India and everywhere else are dear to the heart of God. Let's go to the next one. The third fact I learned late, and I think you already have been looking at this as part of your series, but human trafficking. This stat will just, I don't know, makes me sick. Here's the statistic. There are more slaves in the world now than at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. I mean, I thought we kicked that thing to the curb. But no, it's alive and well. It's a multi-billion dollar business. Most people estimate that other than drugs and arms, it's the top business in the world is the buying and selling of human beings, many of them children. So let's read what those Indian children are holding up on their sign out loud. We are not for sale. We are protecting them and teaching them of their value and the tricks of the traffickers, and we're teaching their parents and their teachers and their pastors so their children can be protected because Jesus tells us to do that and we care, okay? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we can help those kids before they get snatched, then we're doing a, a, a really important thing. So these kids are in Manila, the Philippines, which is the global center of the cyber porn industry where people can use a credit card to pay, to watch on their screen in any country in the world, live acts between adults and children. And those darling children in Manila are the most vulnerable to that kind of abuse, oppression. That is not Jesus's will for their lives. The church is stepping in to advocate and to make a difference and to prevent and protect. So. You've seen or heard about Kevin Austin, who leads the Set Free movement in the Free Methodist Church. He says, sponsoring a child is the, first, is the first line of defense against child trafficking. That's his own sponsor girl in Cambodia. It's a dollar a day, $30 a month, through the organization that you can just stand there for one child. I mean, I let a dollar a day slip through my fingers. 
I've gotten up to the point where, I mean, I'm sponsoring nine kids now, and I think I should probably make it 10. You know, a dollar a day, it's a candy bar that I shouldn't eat anyway, or it's a cup of coffee at McDonald's and not Starbucks. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is what Jesus said when he began his ministry. Let's call it his manifesto or his inaugural address at the beginning of his public ministry. Listen to the words of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, guess what? This good news is not just good news in the rest of the world. This good news is good news right here, and you know it, right here in Bradford. Right here it says, what's Jesus's, what's the bullseye on Jesus' target? To reach the poor, to bless and lift the poor, to set the captives free, to open the eyes of the blind, to transform the lives of the last, the least, the lost, the broken. Jesus values exactly the opposite of what the world values. The world's value system says you're more important if you're richer or if you've got more education or more stuff, but oh no, Jesus has a whole different view. He's come to, to, to change the world from the bottom up. Let's look at the next slide. The final fact that I wanna share with you that I learned late is that the church is the hope of the world. The church is the hope of Bradford, isn't it? Is there anything else that's transforming lives like encountering Jesus? All right, let's look at this, what I mean by that. ICCM, that I'm no longer the director of, but I'm still 100% advocating for, envisions this, a world where every child, every child, is loved, safe, and developing their God-given potential. I know that Pastor Zoe was the children's pastor here for quite a few years, and I'm sure that was your same heart that every child would know they are loved by God and by other people, and they would be safe from all kinds of different hurt, harm, and danger and developing their God-given potential. Here's four ways that we want them to develop. The first one is spiritually. So this is a group of kids in Haiti. Uh, it was chapel at the end of the school year, and they asked me to preach, but the pastor said, let's pray. And when he did, all like 800 kids stood up, turned around, knelt down, and started praying out loud at the same time. And I realized, oh my goodness, Haiti has all kinds of problems, and it's bad right now. There's like five kidnappings a day in Port-au-Prince. They're hungry. There's a lot of chaos in the streets. Haiti's a rough spot. But they're holding on to Jesus. And those kids in those schools, they're learning that two plus two equals four. They're learning how to read and write Creole and French, and they're learning about Jesus. Next then physical development. Jesus is really clear about feeding the hungry, and especially kids who don't have adults to provide for them, orphans, and other kids who need just plain old daily bread. And we get to be a part of answering that prayer when we serve them in that way. And the third one is intellectual development or cognitive. So these little kids are graduating from kindergarten in a little village called Bitaganet in Ethiopia. Now those little outfits make them look smart, don't they? <laughs> but they're getting an opportunity they would have never had because they have sponsors who are changing the trajectory of their lives. And then finally, social development. These are kids at one of our homes in India, and the truth is God designed us for one another. I heard this sermon title a couple, last week, and I thought, oh my word, it's heresy. You know what the sermon was called? God is not enough. <gasps> what do you mean God is not enough? Don't tell me that. Well, the point was, God made us for one another. He put gifts in the body to serve one another. He said not just to love God, but love each other. And that's the second commandment. And in fact, he said it's equal to the first commandment. He didn't make us to just go in our private corner and cry out our problems to God and never tell anybody. He meant that we would be a part of doing life together so that we can weep with those who weep and we can rejoice with those who rejoice and we can build each other up and disciple one another and love one another. And so these kids are learning how to be in community. They're learning to be less self-focused and self-centered and to care for the other kids around them. And that's part of being discipled to know Jesus, okay? So 
there was a conversation where a, a young man came up to Jesus and said, I want to follow you. What does it take to follow you? And Jesus said, well, obey the commandments. He said, I got that one down. What else? Jesus said, well, okay, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your stuff and come and follow me. And the guy walked away sad because he had a lot of stuff. He was more attached to his stuff than he was to following Jesus. It's a sad story. And Jesus' disciples said, wow, like you just let that one get away. Why? What's wrong here? Why won't that guy follow you? And Jesus said this hard word. Truly, I tell you, it'll be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because I think when we have enough prosperity that we're comfortable, we don't acknowledge our need for God. Now, some of you have come to the end of your rope and you realize that your stuff is never going to save you. And you've realized that just having a comfortable roof over your head is not enough. There's something else that God has for you. It's not just about material stuff. But when we have more, and in this case I'm speaking globally, I'm talking about the American church, when we have more, we don't feel the desperation for God that others who don't have all that comfort do. And so Jesus says, you know, in, other, in, in, in order to get into his kingdom, we have to humble ourselves like a child, or in this case, like a camel squeezing through a very small opening. It's not easy because we don't want to get small. We want to be big. We want to be self-sufficient. But Jesus invites us to recognize our dependence like a child. Let's go to the other one then. At the end of that, his disciples said, Peter said, well, I've left everything to follow you. So, like, I did better than that guy. What do I get for that? And Jesus said, well... Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So Jesus invites us to a new way of living where we hold our possessions loosely, where we recognize that we've been blessed with all kinds of gifts that we might have taken for granted. And we can use those for the kingdom of God to meet needs locally or globally. We don't have to hold on to stuff. I mean, me, mine, and ours is so much a part of our mentality, but Jesus wants us to hold them in a loose way, in a new way, and help, help to recognize that they're gifts from God and they're intended to be used for his beautiful purposes for all his people. And so I'm just inviting you to a new way of thinking about poverty and riches and then Let's just celebrate that many who are first will be last. And some of those people who never had uh, two pennies to rub together on earth will be great in Jesus' kingdom. The last slide is to let you know about International Child Care Ministries. That's the website if you were going to want to go and choose a child on the website to support. That would be a beautiful thing. That's a brand new logo. I just got it in my email this week. It's probably not even on the website yet. But if you... If the Lord is tugging at your heart to say, well, I could help one, then I'll just invite you to go to that website. Would you pray with me? A lot of times, Lord, we ask you to open our eyes. And I just think today you've used some of our loved ones from different places in the world to open our eyes, to see ourselves in a new light, to recognize our privilege, the fact that we have public schools to go to and flush toilets and water and some infrastructure and some safety and freedom to worship you. We've got all kinds of resources and assets that we might not always recognize as the blessings they are. But thank you for opening our eyes. Lord, I pray that you will make us part of your solution, that we'll have kingdom values and kingdom vision so that we recognize what you're all about. Lord, I thank you for this church and the ways that they're continuing to welcome people in so that brand new people are experiencing Jesus' kingdom in new ways every single week. So I pray for any who are here today to just say yes to you and to say, I want to know how, 
how you want me to live, how you see this world, how you see me. And God, I pray this would be the beginning of an adventure for all of us as we trust you more, as we're more grateful and more generous because we recognize the privilege you've given us. Lord, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'm on. I th- hey, all right. What a blessing and a privilege to have her here with us and, and just to share her heart and open our eyes to not only the needs within our midst, but all around the world that we truly are so blessed and we have the blessed opportunity to share that, that with others, not only our, our wealth, but, but the truth of Jesus and breaking those chains for other people and bringing freedom. So, um, Let's go ahead and and prepare to receive the offering. If you would uh, take out your connection card also, and um, uh, you can respond to the message here. What is it that God said to you today? What is it that's that's on your heart? We would love to to pray for you in that. Also, if you you made a decision to follow Christ today, if you're or if you're rededicating your your decision to to continue to follow Him, um, you can check that, and we would love to to provide you with some resources on your journey there and um but let's go ahead and you can take out your offering envelopes and and prepare your offering you can also give online and and on our app as well but um let's go ahead and pray and uh, and prepare to bless this offering father we just are so grateful lord for all of your many blessings to us not only financially lord our our wealth of though we may have have thought that we're limited lord we see that we have such abundance, truly, Lord, with what you have blessed us with and, and not only just in our resources, Lord, but in, in being able to follow you openly and freely, sharing your word and, and telling your truth to others and, and bringing freedom to others without any fear of, of being imprisoned or shot or, or just oh, so, so many issues that our brothers and sisters around the world are facing. Lord, I, I pray that you would give us the opportunity through this giving and, and through many other opportunities, Lord, to, to help come alongside and, and reach others with your truth and, and help, um, help them just to, to find the freedom that we are so blessed to have here. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. We pray that you would bless this offering and and multiply it, Lord. Um, We just praise you and we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and receive that today. And um, just a couple closing announcements. So next steps, um, I mentioned earlier, start here. We'll be uh, in the auditorium afterwards if uh, for start here and step two, both meet here, and then you will be uh, split up to go to your class um, after service and um, and also our, our DNA. So if you're wondering what our church is about or, or need a refresher, check it out on the back of your program, our purpose, mission, mission vision, values, and what we're all about, our heart here. Um, and if, if today is your first time joining us today, welcome. Uh, we have a gift for you, our tra- Open Arms Travel Mug. You can grab one of those in the coffee shop area. Our thank you for coming today. And uh, if you brought a guest, grab one of those as well. Our thank you for, for sharing them with us today. And if you need a Bible, grab one of those as well. If you know someone who needs a Bible, please take one of those. Uh, and we invite you up for prayer. There'll be people up front to pray with you. If you're um, just facing some heartache today, if there's just burdens or you need healing in an area, please come up and, and we would love to, to pray with you and walk alongside of you with that. Um, so be blessed this week. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.